the trial and the change One thing remains One thing remains Your love never fails and never gives Never runs out on me Your love never fails and never gives Never runs out on me Your love never fails and never gives It never runs out on me
Trust.
Good morning, and welcome to Grace Lutheran Church. We are so glad you could be here to join us for this online worship. Whether you've been a member of Grace your entire life or whether you've just stumbled upon us on YouTube this morning, we are so glad that you can be here and that we can worship together. A couple of quick notes about the service. Later in our worship, we will be celebrating Holy Communion, and so we invite you, if you have uh, something available at your home, like wine or bread, to have that uh, ready so that we can all share in that wonderful sacrament together. One other announcement we have this morning. We are continuing our Secret Santa program. Uh, this is a program that benefits children who are uh, cared for by Pillars Community Health, one of our local nonprofits here in the LaGrange area. And we are still looking for a few people to sponsor either a family or to simply uh, donate a, a gift for a child ages 2 to 17, anywhere in that age range. Uh, you can drop off those gifts here at the church. Uh, just by the front door, there's a, a spot that um, is labeled, and you can, you can see where those go. And if you'd like to sponsor a family, there's information on our website under the announcements section that can tell you how to do that and how to, how to be a, a bigger part of this program as well. We thank you uh, so much to those of you who have already sponsored children and already made donations. It makes such a difference to so many of these families in our community. We're going to continue now with our worship, with the call to worship, and I invite you to uh, follow along with the words that appear on your screen. In worship, may we be as welcoming as Sarah and Abraham, who were quick to serve the stranger. In faith, may we proclaim that nothing is too big for God. In moments of holy surprise, may we laugh with deep abiding joy. For God is in the holy surprise. God is in the winding path. And God is in our presence today. Let us worship holy God. We continue our worship with confession and forgiveness. God of unexpected joy and answered prayers, we confess that sometimes things feel too good to be true, while at other times we wonder if you hear us at all. When life unravels for the worst, we blame you. But when life unravels for the best, filling our days with holy surprise, we tend to praise ourselves thinking we've earned this unexpected joy. Forgive us. Help us to see you in our midst. And with every breath that turns into a laugh, draw us closer to you. Amen. Beloved of God, hear the good news of the gospel, which is for you and for all. God takes the broken pieces of our lives and hems us in before and behind. Whatever you have done, whatever you have failed to do, whoever you are, whoever you wish you were but are not, you are forgiven in the goodness of Christ's love. You are enough. You are set free. Let us live in joy. Thanks be to God. Our worship continues with our gathering song, Let All Things Now Living. Obediently shine. 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray, God of unending surprises, this life is a tapestry of moments woven together, and we long to be weavers of love. In this season, we gather and pray that you would unravel our bias unravel our assumptions, unravel our worry, unravel our fear. Unravel what it, whatever it is that keeps us from you. And as you do, clear space in our hearts for your word. We are listening. We are praying. Amen. As I sit under the oaks of Brookfield, I read today scripture from Genesis, the 18th chapter. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. As he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day, he looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, oh yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham, a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would have ever said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. This is the word of the Lord. Beloved of God, grace to you and peace from the one who created us, redeemed us, and moves among us still. Amen. I have a very serious question for you this morning, church. When was the last time you really laughed? 
I don't mean a little chuckle. I mean, when was the last time that you had a head thrown back, tears streaming down your cheeks, gasping for air kind of full body laugh? Was it just this morning? And if it was, would you please call me after worship and tell me the story so that I can join in your laughter? Was it a few months ago? Was it pre-pandemic? Was it so long ago that you can't even remember? They say that laughter is the best medicine, but it feels like the reasons for laughter have been in short supply lately. You know, because of all the things. Over the last 10 weeks at Grace, we've been exploring biblical narratives of unraveling. I know that a series like this is new for our congregation, so I've appreciated hearing from so many of you who have reached out to talk about how appropriate this theme has felt to the time that we are living in. The news of another stay-at-home advisory stands as a stark reminder to how this pandemic has unraveled everything about our lives. A sense of public trust in this divided country that's managed to politicize even this global pandemic just adds another layer to the fraying. And we've been talking about pandemics and divisions for so long now that honestly, I'm pretty much sick of talking about it. We all know. Things are really hard. They might get harder yet before they get better. And even when they do get better, they're still going to be different. COVID has changed everything, and there's just no going back to life as it once was. That's a lot of bad news to try and process, even though we've had eight months of practice by now, so let me just cut to the chase and tell you the good news, which comes to us in this delightful little story from the book of Genesis. When we think things are ending, God is just getting started. When we think things are ending, God is just getting started. In case it's been a while since you've encountered the story of Abraham and Sarah, who are known as Abram and Sarai in earlier chapters of Genesis, let me fill you in on a little backstory. We first encounter Abraham in Genesis 12, when God calls him seemingly out of the blue to leave his homeland and his people and to go to a land that he's never seen. Along with God's call comes a threefold promise. First, that Abraham will be a great nation with as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. Second, that Abraham and his descendants will inherit the land of Canaan. And third, that they will be a blessing to the whole world. Well, all of that is well and good, but there's one pretty big hiccup in this whole great nation promise. Abraham has no children, and his wife, Sarah, is barren. It's pretty hard to become a great nation if you don't have even one child. Well, they can't produce an heir, but they also can't let this promise slip through their fingers. So Abraham and Sarah take matters into their own hands. They give Sarah's handmaid, Hagar, to Abraham as a concubine, and Hagar gives birth to a son that she names Ishmael. Abraham and Sarah will later banish Hagar and Ishmael to the desert, where they almost die. That's a story for a different day, but their cruel choice is one of a number of pretty crappy decisions that Abraham and Sarah will make as they try to follow the God who called them. I mention it now as yet one more reminder that God has this habit of using people who are sort of messed up to do some pretty great things, which frankly, gives me some hope for all of us. Anyway, after Ishmael is born, Sarah gets her own blessing from God and her own promise as well. God promises that Sarah will give Abraham a son, a true heir, and that she will be the mother of nations and the bearer of kings. Cool, cool, cool. This is an amazing promise. It just has one problem also. By the time God makes it, our sister Sarah is 90 years old. Abraham knew as well as we do that 90-year-old women don't have babies, and so when God tells him this plan, Abraham literally falls on his face in a fit of laughter at the absurdity of this idea. 
He reminds God that he already has Ishmael, so maybe God could just make it easier on all of them and make Ishmael his heir. But God's like, no, I'm going to make Ishmael a great nation too, but you're going to have a true heir, and my covenant will be with him, the one that Sarah, your wife, is going to bring into the world. Which brings us to the part of the story that we just heard a few minutes ago. Abraham, wiping his dusty face as he sits outside his tent in the heat of the day, notices three strangers standing nearby. When he sees them, he kicks those 100-year-old legs into gear, running toward them and bowing down before them. Hospitality was a huge, huge deal in that time, and Abraham spares nothing in making sure that these men can rest and enjoy a good meal made from the finest flour and meat that Abraham has. As the strangers eat and drink, they ask about Sarah, wondering where she is. Well, Sarah is inside the tent, eavesdropping on this conversation in which one of the strangers tells Abraham that Sarah will have a son. I love, love, love Sarah's cheekiness as she listens from the tent. I imagine her catching a glimpse of her 100-year-old husband with his thin wisp of white hair, his sagging skin, and his bony shoulders that are probably slightly bent by now, as she laughs to herself. (laughs) A son? Can two old people like us even have pleasure anymore? I'm pretty sure I would have liked Sarah. The Lord overhears Sarah's laughter and asks Abraham, why did she laugh? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Is anything too wonderful? for the Lord. Sarah and Abraham's dream of having a child had been long dead, but God keeps this promise to Sarah. She gives birth to a son and they name him Isaac, which means laughter in Hebrew, because as Sarah says, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone hears will laugh with me. Friends, I want to remind you that the Bible is not a science book. Rather, the Bible is a book of many books that tells the long story of God's extravagant love and mercy poured out on this world. Though I wouldn't put anything past our God, wondering over whether a 90-year-old woman in the ancient world really actually conceived and bore a child misses the point. The point is that when we think God, when we think things are ending, God is just getting started. I don't know all the details of what's come undone in your lives in these difficult days. I don't know all of the endings, all of the unravelings, but I do know this. We are loved and led by a God of promise. The promises of God might not always be easy to see or touch or understand. They might seem absurd or impossible, And they might take a hundred long and difficult years to unfold. But they are there. God's promises are there. Next week will be our last in this Unraveled worship series. It will also be our commitment to Connect Sunday, where we will invite one another to connect or reconnect to Grace's ministries in some specific ways. And then we'll move into Advent, a season that begins with another unexpected promise of a child. This time, a child whose name means not laughter, but Savior. A child who will be for us God's ultimate promise, that where we see an ending, God is just getting started. My prayer for you today, dear church, and throughout the rest of this week, is that this little story from Genesis would fill you with a sense of the promises of God in your own life. Promises that, if we could see the ending, might have us too falling on our faces in a fit of laughter like Abraham, or chuckling behind the tent door like Sarah. Promises that fill God's own heart with laughter, because God delights in you, and God delights in the holy absurdity of unexpected blessings that are always, 
always unfolding in our lives, even if we don't yet have eyes to see them. So laugh it up, people of God. This is not the end. God is just getting started. Amen. We have now reached the point in our worship where if we were gathered together in person, we'd be passing our offering plates. Of course, we can't do that online, and so instead we're using this time to share a, a reflection of some of the ministry that is still happening in and around Grace. Before we move on to that reflection, though, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to so many of you who have been able to continue your support of Grace Thank you to those of you who have been able to begin supporting Grace in your finances and in your prayers and in your time and talents. God has given all of us so much, so much to be thankful for, so much, much that has been entrusted into our care. And one of the ways we care for what God has done for us is by giving back, giving back our time, giving back in our talents, and giving back in our finances. And so we thank you to all of you who continue to make Grace Lutheran Church a wonderful and a thriving place uh, full of amazing ministry opportunities. Today, I want to share with you a little bit about our Genesis program. This is our youth program that works with high schoolers and all the way down to about seventh grade. And I have uh, Kellen Knopp, who's going to tell us a little bit about what this Genesis program means to him. Uh, one of the programs that we together as Grace Lutheran Church are supporting and watching grow each and every day, even in this time of COVID-19. So, Kellen? Uh, well, I don't know. There's just a lack of structure because there's nothing going on. Usually I would always be in like school clubs, school sports during the school year. But now that's all gone, and I only go to school two days a week, so what am I going to do for the rest of the thing? Like, Genesis gives me something to do that's actually fun, believe it or not, uh, on something to look forward, uh, something to, look forward to. It's, it's, it's a great program. Um, well, at Genesis, we always uh, do the obligatory Bible services, because it's a, our Bible studies, actually. Um, because of course it's Genesis, we have to learn about the God and stuff like that. We always like to, we always like get like deep discussion questions about like our relationship with God and how we should view God. 
Um, like, like last week, we talked about different uh, sections of the Lutheran Church and what our church believes in, which I think is very important to discuss what our personal beliefs are. So we, we, we know, like, because I didn't even know, like, when I joined the church, I came to this church because my parents go to this church. I don't know what we're all about, so it's always nice to learn things like that. Yes, I would like to say thank you so much. Like, Genesis has really, really helped me develop my relationship with God and develop meaningful friendships with peers. Will you pray with me? Oh God, last Sunday we thought this would be another hard week, and it was. Another 300,000 people got the virus and 6,000 or so died. More and more people are losing their jobs and businesses are closing. Our country is almost equally divided over the results of the election. It seems pretty close to hopeless. And so thank you for the reminder that nothing is impossible for you. Even for a 90 year old woman who gave up the idea of having a baby 50 years before that, could have a boy she would call laughter. We remember, Lord, that you know our situation and that, that it is not your desire that things be this way. We honestly don't know what we should pray except, will you help us? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. It's hard to admit, but some of us have contributed to the polarization. Some of us have said that people who do not wear masks and get the virus, well, they get what they deserve. And some of us have celebrated that our candidate won without remembering that those who voted for the other candidate feel the same despair we felt four years ago. Will you forgive us, Lord? Will you help us to be kind to one another, to treat each other in that hard way as we want them to treat us? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the numbers of people with coronavirus who need to be hospitalized increase, we pray for those who care for them the supervisors who try to find more equipments and beds, the doctors and nurses who provide the hands-on care day after day, and the hospital personnel who transport the patients and clean the rooms. Will you help them? Will you give them the physical strength and the emotional strength they need to get through this valley of the virus? Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick, sick with the virus, sick with despair, sick with conflicts in families who find it so hard to be together now, and sick with illness that cannot be cured. We remember Sandy, Sarah, David, John, Beth, all those on our prayers for healing and strength and those we name now on our lips or silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray in the name of Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be held on to, but emptied himself and came as a servant to heal us, to save us, and to give us life. Amen. As we come for communion, we remember that Jesus was always the guest. In the homes of Peter and Jairus, Mary and Martha, he was always the guest. At the meal table of the wealthy, when he would always plead the case of the poor, 
He was always the guest, upsetting polite company, befriending isolated people, and welcoming the stranger. He was always the guest. But here at this table, Jesus is the host. Those who wish to serve him must be served by him. And those who wish to follow him must first be fed by him. This is the table where God intends to nourish us. So come you who hunger, who hunger and thirst for a deeper life, for a fuller life, for a better world. Jesus Christ, who has sat at our tables, now invites us to be the guests at his. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we go to communion, if you are with others today, serve them, saying this is the body of Christ given for you, and this is the blood of Christ shed for you. And if you are by yourself today, except for the Spirit of God who is with you, hear these words of Jesus for you. This is the body of Christ given for you, and this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us share this meal that makes us one. receive the benediction. As you go on your way, may the Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he be near you to defend you. May he go before you to show the way. May he go behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, and within you to give you peace. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just a word And suddenly I'm not afraid Cause you speak And freedom brings There is hope In every single word you say I don't wanna, I don't wanna miss, miss one word you speak, speak. 
Cause everything you say means life to me I don't wanna miss one word you speak Quiet my heart, I'm listening Everything you say means life to me Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks.